So those who have been here a while know that periodically, probably on average once a year or so, it's uh, my custom to preach through 10 psalms at a go, and we're now uh, going to be working through Psalm 91 through Psalm 100. We are uh, in the next decade of psalms, one psalm uh, per week. As you may have noticed from the reading of this psalm, this psalm is for those who need their God to be a shield and a buckler. This is for those who need a fortress. This is for those who are in trouble. Those who have no troubles don't need to listen. Those who have no difficulties don't need to pay any attention at all. But as it says in Job, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. All of us deal with troubles, and all of us have to learn how to deal with troubles. And the only way to learn how to deal with troubles is to deal with them in Christ, to deal with them in the one who dealt with trouble perfectly. Now, according to a tradition among the Jews, if a psalm is not attributed, as this one is not attributed, then the credit should go to the author of the previous psalm. This is simply a tradition among the Jews. It's not authoritative. Uh, there's no basis for being dogmatic about this. But, it, but if that, there's something to it, then this means that Psalm 91 was composed by Moses because Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses. The reason I think that this is suggestive is that the theme of this psalm fits the experience of Israel in the wilderness in remarkable ways. In addition, it's quite striking that the devil quotes from this psalm when Jesus was on his way to being the victorious Israel during his temptation of 40 quote-unquote years in the wilderness. Uh, Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. Israel was tempted in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Israel fell in the temptations. Jesus stood in the temptation. The, The message is unmistakable. Christ is the new Israel. Christ is Israel finally doing it right. All the way through the Old Testament, all Israel could do is wrong. All right, they would be restored, they would they'd fall into idolatry, they would get into trouble, they'd call out to the Lord, the Lord would deliver them, they thank the Lord, and then they got into idolatry again. You turn a page, they're into it again. And then you turn a page, they're delivered, you turn another page, they're into it again. So uh, uh, Israel, throughout the Old Testament, is nothing but a perpetu- almost a perpetual motion machine of failure. Just they, they just keep failing. They stand up, they're delivered, they fall down. Face plant after face plant after face plant. It, uh, and this despite God's remarkable interventions on their behalf. Uh, the, the greatest and most remarkable being, of course, the Exodus, where the, that, that generation's great superpower, uh, Egypt, was destroyed. The sea divided. The millions of people walked through. Bread fell out of the sky. You know, God, God was really attentive to the Jews. And yet, Their bodies were scattered over the wilderness because they would rebel against him consistently over and over again. So Jesus is finally, when when we get to uh, Matthew and and we're reading about Israel in the wilderness for 40 days and the devil is successfully resisted, we see Israel finally standing. Israel finally doing it right. And if we want to do it right, we have to do it right in him. If we want to be the Israel that is pure and upright and righteous, we have to be pure, upright, and righteous in him. So let's consider how that works. In this psalm, the shadow of the Almighty is a safe place to dwell. The shadow of the Almighty is a safe place to dwell. If you're you're in someone's shadow, you're right next to them. If you're in someone's shadow, you're right next to them, and that's the safe place to be, verse 1. And ultimately, it's the only safe place to be. But don't assume that this is obvious to the carnal mind, because it says here that it's a secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So it's a secret place, but also remember, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, as it says in Psalm 25. And he will show them his covenant. So the secret place is something that is shown to us by God. God will reveal this secret place to us. But we need to fear him. And we need to, and we need to uh, be uh, resolved to fear him. And again, we can't do that unless he's giving that to us. And so he is show, he's showing us his kindness by showing us the secret of the Lord. So fear God. Fear God and he will show you that secret. 
And if he shows you that secret, then you're dwelling in the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord himself is the final fortress. To be in that fortress is to trust him. To be in the fortress is to have faith in God, to, have, to trust God, to believe in God, to have faith in God. That is what it means to be in the fortress that protects you. That's in verse 2. Like a rabbit to his hole, like a bird to his thicket, we take to the Lord. Does trouble arise? Where do you go? Does trouble arise? Men and women instinctively cry out to their God. When they're in trouble, they cry out to their God. When, pe- when there's a hurricane and the people all cry out to the federal government, what does that tell you? Well, that's their God. Right? They, they're turning to man. They want to, they want to be delivered by the government, or they want to be delivered by some sort of intervention from the side. But, but everybody has this in common. Everyone cries out to their God. When we are in trouble, we cry out to God, our fortress. Now, what will this God deliver us from? Well, it says from the snare of the fowler, that is from any devious enemies, the way someone would trap a bird uh, is, a, is the fowler. That's a, there are tricks. Birds are smart. And so you have to be tricky to catch them. So God delivers us from the snare of the fowler, from devious enemies. He also delivers us, verse 3, from the deadly pestilence. Then comes a striking metaphor, really. I think it's an astonishing metaphor. It says, we will be safe under his feathers. We will be safe under his feathers, under his wing. Think of yourself living on the mercy seat, the wings of the cherubim being emblematic of his wings. So the cherubim... um, the cherub, cherubim are, have their wings overarching the mercy seat. If you're under the wings that are emblematic of the Lord's wings, the cherubim are not the Lord, but they are emblematic of his wings. You are living there on the mercy seat. And his truth will be our armor. Verse 4. There's no need to fear night terrors or arrows during the day. Verse 5. Whether epidemics by night or wasting destruction by day. Verse 6. The reference to arrows here is probably still referring to pestilence. So um, when thousands are falling all around you, as they did back in Egypt, and then again a few times in the wilderness, there is yet no need to fear. So that's one of the, when God visited the plagues on Egypt, what, what did God do? He had Israel in the land of Goshen preserved from all these plagues. They were seeing thousands of people dying. They were seeing Egypt destroyed, but they were protected. They were in that zone of protection. And then you have the same sort of thing happening in the, in the wilderness when uh, the Jews are out in the wilderness and their periodic rebellions or, or murmurings and stuff. The, those who trusted the Lord were, per, were preserved and protected during those times. This is very, um, th- this reminds us of that, that period in history. And we're not talking, like if, if you look in uh, Earlier in the Psalms, you can see instances where thousands falling could be an indication of battle. So you could be protected in battle while thousands may fall. Here, it's thousands falling um, in a pestilence. And unlike, unlike a battle, in a battle, you can see the other army. You, you can see the spears. You can see the chariots. You can see the arrows. But with pestilence, particularly uh, in ancient times, it was no telling where it was going to come from, no telling who it was going to hit. Um, and you just had to walk trusting the Lord. And so you will see with your own eyes what will happen to the wicked, verse 8. Because you've made the Lord your refuge and place of habitation, the plague cannot touch you, verses 9 and 10. Charles Spurgeon tells a story of uh, there was an outbreak of, a, of an epidemic in London during Spurgeon's ministry, and he said there was, it, was rare, it was rare that there was a day without a funeral. Right, it, was not like, it was not like the Black Death. It was not like the uh, thousands falling, but it was uh, remarkable for the 19th century. And Spurgeon was involved with a funeral every day, and he was, walking, uh, he was walking home after one such a funeral, exhausted, beat, um, just d- very discouraged. And he walked by a shop, and the shopkeeper, I think it was a chemist's shop, but it, the shopkeeper had this passage, You've made the Lord your refuge and place of habitation. The plague cannot touch you. He had a sign up in the window saying, quoting that verse. And Spurgeon stopped and was instantly rejuvenated, encouraged, because the promise is for those who receive it in faith. 
as God had his saints marked in the book of Ezekiel and in Revelation, you also are marked. Before the, before the judgment falls, God sends out his angels and marks the ones that are not going to be touched by it. That's what it means to be in his fortress. You are marked. You, are under, you dwell under the protection of the cloud and fire. Now, why is this? Why is this possible? Well, because God will order his angels to protect you in that place. Verses 11 and 12. God will order his angels to protect you there. You will trample lions underfoot along with adders, young lions, and dragons. Verse 13. So God promises to deliver the one who truly loves him, the one who knows his name. Verse 14. When he calls, his God will answer. Verse 15. God will honor him with long life and will show him his salvation. Verse 16. Now, if we want to uh, claim the promises of God, if we want to trust in the promises of God, walking through a world like this one, we want to, we want to do so intelligently and in faith, but we don't want to treat God like as, as though he were a vending machine. We don't want to name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of uh, approach to the promises of God. We can't utilize him. We can't work him. We can't say, okay, I'm trusting you, and now you're obligated to do whatever I demand. He is obligated to do whatever he has promised. He's not, he's not obligated to do whatever we cook up as our, our idea of what he ought to be doing. All right, do you see the difference? But the Bible talks about answers to prayer in very pointed ways. All right, the, the, we are given astonishing promises with regard to answers to prayer, with regard to our prayers, and we are giving, given astonishing promises like these about how we are going to be protected when trouble comes. So if we want to know what it looks like If we want to know what it looks like to believe God's promises accurately, fully, and completely, we have to apply the psalm the way we should apply every psalm, and that is to Jesus. Who read this psalm and understood it? Who read this psalm? Who memorized this psalm and and understood it perfectly? There is... And, and that's, of course, the Lord Jesus. All of, all of the Psalms find their fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus understands this Psalm, right? Jesus gets it. And what happened to him? Well, he was crucified, right? But that was not the end of the story. Did, did Jesus read this Psalm and say, oh, I claim the promise, and now all the troubles vanished? No, right? It wasn't like the sun came out and the clouds broke and it was, you know, uh, rainbows, rainbows and unicorns. It was, it was not that kind of thing at all. The sky went black. All right, there was, there was a fierce judgment, but Jesus was in the secret place of the Most High. Jesus was preserved. This psalm and the promises that this psalm carries apply to Jesus perfectly, and Jesus shows us how it's done. All right, so we want to, we want to pay close attention to this text. And, and the reason we want to pay, pay attention to it is that this is the psalm that Satan quoted to Jesus in the course of tempting him. The devil quoted verses 11 and 12 while tempting Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. He was saying, in effect, that if you manifest yourself in a dramatic act of power, then these verses will apply. God will keep you from falling down and dashing your foot on a stone. All you have to do is a little showboating. All you have to do is get on top of the temple and throw yourself off in a grandiose display, right? God's going to protect you. You won't dash your foot against a stone. That was the devil's suggestion. So the reply from Jesus was telling. Consider what it says in Matthew 4, 6, and 7. And saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, remember at the, what happened at the baptism right prior to this. At the baptism of Jesus, uh, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. God has spoken from heaven, you are my son. And the devil comes and says, if you're the son. All right, he, throws, he throws shade on the word of God. So the same thing happened in the Garden of Eden. God says, don't eat from that tree. And uh, the devil starts, c- comes up and starts suggesting thought experiments. Well, you won't die. It's, there, there are different ways to interpret this. There, there are different schools of thought. When it comes to touching the tree and eating from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there are different schools of thought. There are different philosophies. Let's experiment and see which one's the right one. Well, the devil loves to th- throw doubt into an area of certainty. God has said from heaven, this is my son. You are my son. 
And the devil comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil did not misquote the verse. All right, he misapplied the verse because he ignored the context, but he didn't misquote it. He didn't change the words. Uh, uh, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, Jesus was not saying that the devil shouldn't be tempting him, the Lord Jesus, although that is also true. It's true that the devil shouldn't have been tempting him, but that's not what Jesus was saying in his reply. Rather, Jesus was saying that if he, Jesus, did what the devil was suggesting, then he, Jesus, would be tempting the Lord as God. Jesus said, if I threw myself off the temple, I'd be testing God. I'd be tempting God. Jesus, therefore, was submitting himself to the authority of Scripture. It wasn't, this was not the scenario. The devil didn't come and say, um, hey, Jesus, why don't you do this? And Jesus replied, hey, I'm God. You shouldn't be tempting me. Right, that's not what the exchange was. J Jesus was not telling the devil that the devil ought to have been obeying the Scriptures. Jesus was saying, if I did what you suggest, I would be disobeying the Scriptures. Jesus was submitting himself to the authority of Scripture. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. But why would it be tempting God to throw himself off the height of the temple? Why would, given, given the psalm and the context of the psalm, why was the devil misapplying it? What was the misapplication? The Lord was a more honest exegete than the devil was being, which should not be surprising to us, right? We're Christians. We think, okay, Jesus is going to have a better grasp of things than the devil does. That's not hard. But let's not just assume it. If we assume, of course, Jesus is right and the devil's wrong, we might not look at the text very closely. Can we see the honesty of the Lord's reply in the text? We should, uh, the devil quotes a psalm, and Jesus responds because Jesus understands the psalm that the devil is twisting. Where, where can we see the Lord's understanding of the text? The three, there are three things that jump out. The first is what Jesus said in reply. He said he would, in fact, be testing or tempting God if he were to do this thing, which should make us look for the makings of that sin in the text. What, what would be the makings of the sin of testing God if Jesus were to do what the devil suggested? What would be uh, an indication in Psalm 91 that Jesus was, would be sinning in that respect? And that leads to the second point, which is that the promise was that God's angel would protect him in all his ways, and the context shows that these are the ways that God assigned or appointed. If the Most High is your habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, verses 9 and 10. If the Lord is your comfort, if the Lord is your fortress, if, if the Lord is the one in whose shadow you're dwelling, it's there that you are protected. It's there that you will not dash your foot against a stone. So it's, it is not the case. Uh, the, the, the promise was not that one couldn't dash his foot against a stone, whatever it was he might be doing, wherever he might be wandering. This is not something you can just, you, can, you cannot go anywhere in the world that you want as the whim strikes you. Just make it up as you go along. Then when you get into the inevitable trouble that you always do when you're off by yourself like that, you can't reach in and pull out Psalm 91 and say, oh, God's going to protect me from the consequences of all my folly. No, it doesn't, wor it doesn't work that way. God protects you under the shadow of his, of his almighty wing. So this is a promise that holds under the feathers. This is a promise that holds in, in a particular place. This is a word that holds under the shadow of the Almighty. But so much, of those, those are principles and important principles, but let's get to the most striking thing about this exchange. And that's the third point. The devil was trying to get Jesus to cast himself down and not dash his foot against a stone. The devil says, cast yourself down, and if you cast yourself down off this high, um, high temple, then you're not going to dash your foot against a stone. This was a complete diversion. What was the faithful one going to do in this psalm? What was going to come next? What is in the next verse? He was going to cast himself down. He came down from heaven. He came down from heaven, and he did what? He tread on lions, serpents, and dragons. 
The point of this passage was not primarily what he was not going to walk on. It was what he was going to walk on. What, what was the Son of God supposed to walk on? What, what, we're talking about the Son of God's feet. When the, devil, when the devil applies this psalm to Jesus, Jesus doesn't reply, you're making a basic exegetical mistake because that, this psalm is not a messianic psalm. No, the devil's right about that. It is a messianic psalm. It is a messianic psalm. It is about Jesus. And it is about the feet of Jesus. That's true. But what will the feet of Jesus do? He's going to walk on adders, serpents. going to walk on lions. going to walk on dragons. So Jesus was not going to be distracted by talk about dashing his foot against a stone when his assigned mission was to dash his foot against a serpent. All right? the, the, the whole point is for Jesus to crush the head of the serpent. With his foot, that's the, that's the first intimation of the gospel in all of Scripture, in Genesis 3.15. We also should reflect, uh, uh, the language here is interesting, in Luke 11.11, 11, there it says that if a son asks for bread, he will not be given a stone. If a son asks for bread, will he be given a stone? And if he asks for a fish, he will not be given a serpent. How much more will God not give a stone instead of a serpent? All right? So Jesus' mission, the mission of the Son of God, was to crush the serpent's head with his foot. Remember that Christ came to earth in fulfillment of the promise that God had made to the serpent in Genesis 3.15. So in Genesis 3.15, God is talking to the serpent. God is talking to the serpent. And in that place, he says this, And the Lord God said, Under the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this conversation in the wilderness between Jesus and the devil was the continuation of an earlier conversation. These two have already met. They know each other. This is not, the devil didn't come across Jesus in the wilderness and try to have to figure out who it was. Well, it must be, must be. The devil knew who Jesus was, and Jesus knew who the devil was. And Jesus was, uh, Jesus was not someone who came into existence at Bethlehem. When God said to the serpent, when God said to the serpent that he was cursed, when God said to the serpent that the seed of the woman was going to crush his head, the seed of the woman was going to walk on him. The seed, of the, the seed of the serpent was done for because he would be tread upon by the Messiah. Jesus knows that conversation. He knows it from the text, and he knows it because he was there. And the devil was there. So this was not the first time they had met. This is the continuation of an earlier conversation. So, and, and incidentally, while we're here, this is a... Uh, you've, you've all seen references in the news from time to time when some, uh, some churches practice snake handling as part of their service, right? In, in Mark 16, it says you will handle snakes. That's talking about the sort of thing that when Paul was shipwrecked on Malta and he gathered wood and the uh, viper came out and bit him and he shook it off into the fire and, and he was not harmed. That's the kind of thing that Jesus was talking about in Mark 16. But certain people have made, made snake handling into a sacrament or into a a liturgical practice, get a little more excitement into the service, I suppose. And periodically, some preacher gets bitten by a serpent, and uh, which I just read within the last month. Somebody was, somebody was bit down in Tennessee. So you say, well, what, what's that for? What do you do? What, what's, the, what's the allure in that? It's the same. This is quite striking because it's the same allure as the temptation to throw yourself off the top of the temple, Right? It's, show, it's showing off, right? The devil says to Jesus on the top of the temple, why don't you show off and God will protect you? Why don't you show off and God will protect you? Why don't you show off and God will protect you? And the snake handling preacher gets up in front and says, I'm going to show off. I'm going to take out a rattler. I'm going to show off, right? Is he, is he doing this because he wants everybody to know how humble he is? No, he wants everybody seeing him up there front handling a poisonous snake. What is that? That is to throw yourself off the temple. It's to, it's to miss the whole point. It's to miss everything about it. There's more to it. 
So Christ is the only one who ever fulfilled the terms of this psalm. Christ is the only one who ever obeyed this psalm perfectly. He's the only one who could, without any reservation, say, My God, verse 2. And he says this even from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's still my God. He was the faithful son who, was made, who had made the most high his true habitation. Verse 9. He had set his love upon his father. Verse 14. He knew the name of God. Also verse 14. And so God promised to deliver him. Verse 15. And the long life promised was in fact given through the power of an indestructible life. Verse 16. And Jesus displayed his understanding of all of this in the wilderness while being tempted and on our behalf. So everything that Jesus did is credited to us. It's not just Jesus dying on the cross that takes care of our sin. It's Jesus is supplying what our sin displaced. When we're sinning, there are, there are two things going on. When we sin, we're doing something that needs to be paid for, but we're also... Uh, doing something instead of the thing we should have been doing. Whenever you've got opportunity, all sin involves opportunity costs. All sin involves doing the wrong thing and displacing the right thing. All right? When you're off chasing sin, you're doing the wrong thing, but there were also things that you ought to have been doing during that time that you didn't do. And Jesus gives you that as well. Jesus not only takes the penalty for the things that you do wrong, Jesus also lives out a perfect life, and that perfect life is also credited to you. You have lived a perfect life in Jesus Christ. You have paid for all your sins in Jesus Christ. You have died in Jesus Christ. You have lived in Jesus Christ. You have lived in Jesus Christ. You've been raised from the dead in Jesus Christ. All of it is from Jesus. And so Jesus resisting temptation in the wilderness is your blessing. Jesus resisted. Jesus resisted, and you can claim that. You can resist in him. You can learn how to resist in him. But it's not just about Jesus detached from us over, you know, over there somehow. Those of us who believe in Christ have found that he who found the secret place is the secret place. J did Jesus find that secret place that this psalm talks about? Yes. Jesus found the secret place and he is that secret place. He who dwelt in the habitation of God is the habitation of God. He who knows the name of God is the name of God. When, you, when you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. When you look to Jesus, you're looking to the Father. So we are privileged to take refuge in him. And in him, every last one of these promises is yours as well. Every promise in Scripture is yours in Christ. Consider how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Jesus is no yes and no. Jesus, in Jesus Christ, all of it is yes. The Jesus who is preached to you, Paul says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you, so the Jesus who's being preached this morning in your hearing, the Jesus that is being preached to you is nothing but yes. In him is not yes and no. It's nothing but yes. For all, and Listen to what Paul says after this. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Let me read that again. For all the promises of God that includes Psalm 91. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. Amen is a, it's not just an, an agreement. It, is, it has the force of an oath. So all the promises of God in him are yes, and all the promises of God in him are amen. Let it be. Let it be so. Sealed with the name of God. That's what amen means. In Jesus' name, amen, it, it, it seals it with the force of an oath. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God, and then the last two glorious words are by us. So these promises have to be manifested somewhere in ordinary regular lives, in, in the lives of ordinary people. It's not just 
fulfilled in Jesus 2,000 years ago, and then we say, isn't that admirable? If Jesus simply did these things that God approved of 2,000 years ago, then Jesus is our hero, but not our Savior. We need a Savior. We need, in that Jesus was heroic, but he was more than heroic. He was a sacrifice. He was the sacrifice for sin. And we look to him as our Savior, as our sacrifice. And that means that all the promises are fulfilled in him, and that if we're in him, all the promises are there for us as well. So then, for you, standing off by yourself in your own name, we have to say that not one of these glorious promises found in Scripture is in any way your possession. If you're off by yourself, operating in your own name, on your own authority, in your own wisdom, if you're off by yourself, you cannot claim anything in the Bible. You cannot, cl- you n- you cannot lay claim to anything simply because it is in your Bible. Non-Christians can own Bibles. Non-Christians can get a Bible. Infidels can walk into a Christian bookstore and buy a Bible. That doesn't make the promise theirs. The issue is not whether the promise is in your Bible, but whether it is in your Christ. You, you, anybody can buy a Bible, but do you have Christ? Is Christ yours? A non-Christian can pick up this, and this is the Word of God to us. We are not disparaging the Bible, but having a Bible in your hand is not the same thing as having Christ. So, it's not whether the promise is in your Bible, but whether it is in your Christ, to whom the Bible bears faithful witness. Remember, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees by saying, you search the Scriptures because you think that it is them, you, in, in them you have eternal life. He says, it is they that bear witness to me. So the Bible is not a mural at which we stare. The Bible is a window through which we see. We are to look through Scripture to the Christ in, through, and behind it. We are to see through the Scriptures to Christ himself. We are not to look at the Word as a substitute for Jesus. This is not a paper Jesus. This is the Word of God that reveals Jesus. When the Spirit is at work, you you encounter Christ through the Word. You don't encounter just paper and ink. If it's just paper and ink, then that's the kind of knowledge that a Pharisee can have. That's the kind of knowledge that a skeptic can have. That's the kind of knowledge that an infidel can have. But you can't have Christ and be an infidel. You can't have Christ and be a skeptic. You can't have Christ and be an unbeliever. If you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, if you have surrendered to him, then Christ is also yours. All right, if you are Christ's, then Christ is yours. Remember what Paul said earlier, all the promises of God in him are yea and and amen to the glory of God by us. And if Christ is yours, what follows? If Christ is yours, what follows from this? All the promises follow. All the promises follow, including these. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus says, I give you power. Now, that's in a non-believer's Bible. Luke 10, 19 is in a non-believer's Bible. But you need to have that promise in Christ. I give you power, Jesus says, to to walk on serpents, to tread on serpents and scorpions, because that's what Psalm 91 is talking about, right? And then in Romans 16, 20, Paul refers to the passage we indicated earlier, Genesis 3.15. What does uh, Paul say? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So Paul is talking to the Roman church, and he says to the Roman church, the promise that the seed of the woman would walk on the serpent, would crush the head of the serpent, that promise is not just Jesus, not just fulfilled in Jesus in isolation, separated from his people. What Jesus goes through, his people who are in him go through. What Jesus does, his people in him do. What Jesus achieves, his people in him achieve. And if Jesus crushes the head of the serpent with his foot, we are his body, we are his feet. If Jesus crushes the head of the serpent, 
which he did at the cross, he also configures history in such a way that we keep duplicating. This sort of thing plays out over and over again. And so we find ourselves doing the same thing. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That tells us that Satan was there in the garden. That tells us in Revelation, it says the, that uh, the devil, that ancient serpent, that ancient dragon. In Psalm 91, we walk on serpents, we walk on lions. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We walk on snakes, we walk on lions, we walk on dragons. We walk on them all, but only in Jesus, only in Christ. And, and, and how, can we, how do we function there? Only by faith. It's only by faith that we're in Christ, and by faith in Christ, he overcomes. And so, remember that all the promises are yea and amen, as Paul says. But this is all, deli- what's the delivery mechanism? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This Jesus, this Jesus who was preached among you, Paul says. This is the, the proclamation of Christ, the proclamation of Jesus, is what brings the... the, the, the Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the authority of Jesus Christ is preached, it's declared, you hear, you believe. And when you believe, you're in the fortress. When you believe, you're behind the shield. When you you believe, the shield and buckler protect you. When you believe, you're under the shadow of the Almighty. And you cannot be touched. You cannot be touched if you're in the Father's hand. It's, It's not possible. And you say, well, Jesus was touched. And he rose from the dead. It did, he didn't say that you can't, ha, you can't uh, it doesn't say that you uh, burst into this happy land where, no, where there are no troubles. It means that you are in a place where by, by faith in God, you are able to see realities that no one around you can see. And this is the peace that passes understanding that Paul talks about in Philippians. The peace that passes understanding enables you to as Stonewall Jackson once said, to feel as safe in battle as I do in bed. To feel as safe in battle as I do in bed. Until God's appointed day for me is up. Right? Until God's assigned day, says in Psalms, our days are numbered, before one, before one of them comes to be, before your assigned time to go comes, you, my friend, are immortal. You cannot be touched. Not a hair of your head can fall from your Head apart from the will of the Father. If, if, if God oversees the, a sparrow can't fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father, how much more is he going to take care of you? All, right? All of this is um, absolutely secure. You are in the Father's hand. No one can take them out of my Father's hand, Jesus says. And so, this is all declared to you. The, the God who does this is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The God who does this is Jesus Christ, the visible image of the invisible Father. He is preached to you. Your task is to hear and to hear with faith. When you hear and hear with faith, you are are hearing from within. You are in Jesus, hearing the proclamation of Jesus. And so, we preach Jesus to you, and we preach Jesus to you so that you might be found in him, and so that you might rejoice in him, and exult in him, and find eternal happiness in him, and for the glory of his great name, become a race of snake walkers in him. Is the devil a roaring lion, seeking whom he he may devour? You are invited, you are summoned, you are required to walk right over him. This is what living faith in a living Christ will do. It's what a living faith in a living Christ necessarily does. It's the only thing that a living faith and a living Christ can do. It can't do anything else. And it doesn't do it by bragging. It doesn't do it by climbing up to the highest pinnacle of the temple. It doesn't do it by inviting everybody all around you to to look at me, look at me as I do this great thing. It does it by simply doing your business, loving your God, worshiping him, doing your duty in your family, doing what's set before you, loving your neighbor, just walking through the ordinary course of your daily life, And then when God privileges it and you turn around and look back at your life, you see a trail of dead snakes. And that's what you want your life to be, a trail of dead snakes that you walked over, not because you were bragging, not because you were like one of those coal walkers who was showing off. You want to to walk on serpents 
because this is how God governs the world. This is how God directs human history. We are always tempted to think, oh, the devil has so much power. Oh, the snakes have so much. Uh, No, 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 no. Simple, humble, trusting faith in Jesus Christ conquers everything. What, What is it? What is it, John says, that overcomes the world? What is it that overcomes the world? Is it not our faith? Not, not our faith in faith, but our faith in Christ, our faith in Jesus. Our faith in Jesus means we're in Jesus, and when we're in Jesus, all the carnage that's done to the kingdom of the evil one is what he does, and he permits us, invites us, summons us to partake in that victory together with him. Our Father and God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. I pray, I pray Father, that you would uh, bless us as we seek, seek out ways to apply what we've heard. And Father, I pray that as we do, you would remember the words that we pray back to you that Jesus taught us to pray, saying. Jesus says that we celebrate this meal in remembrance of him. But this is not the first time in redemptive history that God gave something to his people for remembrance. After the flood, remember, God put the rainbow in the sky as a memorial. At the Exodus, God gave the Passover to Israel so they would remember that they had been slaves in Egypt. God gave the sacrifices to Israel as memorials so they would regularly remember that God took away their sins. Even the high priest wore a breastplate of precious stones and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the stones, it says, as memorials. But one of the important thing, themes that emerges in many of the memorials in Scripture is the theme of God's remembrance of us. Not only do the signs remind us that we are God's people, they are also said to be reminders for God that we are his people. Genesis says that God will see the rainbow and remember his covenant. In the Passover, God saw the blood on the doors of the faithful Israelites and passed over their homes and spared the firstborn and brought Israel out of Egypt. Scripture says that when the sacrifices were offered, God smelled the aroma and remembered his covenant and mercy with Israel. And likewise, it says that when the high priest ministered before the Lord, bearing the names of the tribes of Israel on his breastplate, God would see the names of the tribes and remember them. Of course, in a strict sense, God never forgets and does not need to be reminded of anything. But God does does not change in any way. But God has determined to be for us in time and in history. And in his providence, our prayers and worship are truly part of how God has determined to act in history. And in this sense, he is pleased to remember us in his favor. All of this is taken up into this memorial meal. We take and eat and drink and remember and believe. But by his infinite wisdom and mercy, when we take and eat and drink and remember him, he delights to remember us. He remembers us in our weakness. He remembers us and he visits us. He is not far off. He is near to all who call upon him in truth. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. So let's pray together. The charge is simple. The charge is fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Not on the serpents, not on the lions, not on the wind, not on the waves, not on your mom or your dad, your brother, your sister, your spouse. Fix your eyes on Jesus. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, you are safe under his wings. Now receive with believing hearts your God's blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And amen.